Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference, brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor for Four Paws International. Before we start, we have a few basic housekeeping items. We want to bring to your attention an important update regarding the conference schedule. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York sessions D, F, and H on the initial schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org to view the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled, so if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature and we will endeavor to answer these questions at the end of the presentation. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning. So if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag G-A-D-M-C-O-N-F in your posts on social media to help us spread the word. A short evaluation will be made available when you exit the session. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help shape the next G-A-D-M-C conference. Finally, a reminder that the video recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year after it has been properly edited. Our first speaker is Tarusha Mishra, an action researcher at Humankind India, who's fulfilling her ambition of making Delhi a compassionate city. She is presenting to us today on the drowning dogs of Mumbai, exclusionary management and dog vulnerabil vulnerability in urban floods. Tarusha, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, good evening from India to everybody. Uh, as uh, I was introduced, my name is Tarusha, and today I'll be talking about uh, the community dogs of Mumbai and their situation in flood, the exclusionary disaster management practices pertaining to them, and the vulnerability analysis of uh, these community dogs. Um, just to give you an overview of what all uh, I'll be talking about today would be the context of my research. Um, I'll be talking about Mumbai a lot as a city. So why I'm going to talk about Mumbai, that will be covered. Then we'll be looking at the disaster management plan for uh, uh, animals in India critically. Talk about why should we in the first place save urban animals. Um, we'll give you a short understanding of what my methodology has been all about. And then uh, we'll talk about the final findings and the way forward. All right. So um, I feel just it's just honest of me to share with you all why did I even first uh, thought about uh, uh, working on this research topic. And that the reason happens to be lucky. Uh, it, this is a stray dog, but I would uh, address the stray dog as urban dog or community dogs in my research. And I shall uh, uh, give the reason of that later on. So uh, Lucky uh, met a tragic fate during uh, 2019 monsoons uh, in Mumbai, where this dog took a shelter from heavy rain in a high-rise society building um, and was uh, beaten brutally by the guard. Um, the dog fought for a week, I think, uh, but couldn't survive. And the question is, a tragic fate for an innocent animal or an urban inhabitant? Being an urban practitioner, uh, everything that I'm going to talk about is going to be about cities and animal in cities. And this is the question with which I start. I'm really sorry, apologies for starting with this distressing uh, picture, but I don't know if this is not, in, uh, not a wake up call for urban practi practitioners and what is. Uh, so um, after Lucky's incident, I started thinking of the larger picture, what actually are real uh, uh, area of concerns. And uh, the first uh, reason that I think is that uh, India is getting, or in fact, the world is getting urbanized at a, at a really fast pace. Uh, today, 
more than half of the world is living in urban areas and cities and by 2050 it's going to be 68 percent of people living in cities <clears throat> now secondly three in five cities worldwide with at least five lakh inhabitants are at risk of natural disasters and one of the deadliest natural disaster has been flooding um 89 percent of world's flood exposed people come from developing countries like india so um one such city in a developing nation like india happens to be mumbai and as you can see uh, in big bold letters all it takes is one shower of rain to flood mumbai mumbai has been chronically uh, getting flooded year after year um reason few reasons being localized flooding due to inadequate drainage uh, which of course uh, 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 tells about the way mumbai has been planned the urban planning and the urban designing of mumbai over the years second is overflow of meethi river so meethi uh, literally translates to sweet in english and uh, uh, a lot of uh, encroachment on uh, the flood plains of meethi river has happened so people living closer to Meti River have definitely not had a very sweet experience during monsoons. And third is combination of high tides and high river flows. Uh, a small context about Mumbai is that uh, it's the financial capital of India and it's uh, popularly called the city of dreams because uh, A, the Bollywood industry, uh, the film industry is in Mumbai. And secondly, um, I think Mumbai is in a state which is the most urbanized in India. A lot of migration happens in Mumbai because a lot of economic opportunities are available to people. But then if this is what the state is of Mumbai, then um, something needs to be done about it. This is year after year rescue operations happening in Mumbai, just a snapshot of it for you all. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we must notice in these pictures is we see a lot of human beings, we see a lot of people, and most of these people come from marginalized backgrounds that you see getting rescued here. But we don't see a single animal being rescued here. So um, in this uh, direction, making disaster management more inclusive for animals in India, uh, the country took its first step towards creating a disaster management plan for animals. Uh, this was done by the department. Sorry? <laughs> oh, oh, um, uh, by the department. Is my voice breaking by any chance? No, you're fine, Tarisha. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So yeah, it was done. Uh, it was uh, issued by the Department of Animal Husbandry, Dairying, and Fisheries in India. So it takes into account livestock, poultry, aquaculture, wildlife, all of that, and basically all the animals um, on whom some sort of livelihood of human beings are dependent on. So this was a great move. But the question is, where are the urban animals? Urban animals are nowhere even mentioned in this disaster management plan. The quest next question comes in, why even save urban animals? And this is a, according to people, this is a very legit question <laughs> that why save urban animals? I say, why not save urban animals, right? But even then, um, Two of my main arguments that become my entry point into this research are first is um, uh, the Marxist uh, scholar Lefebvre and David Harvey even has talked a lot about right to the city, right? That everybody who lives in a city deserves a certain uh, level of uh, um, uh, facilities and uh, a dignified uh, living in cities. That uh, argument now has to be extended, it's high time it should be extended to a more than human right to the city that as much as human beings are inhibiting city space, so are these urban animals. <clears throat> that is one. Second is the aspect of public health. So um, a lot of these animals coexist with people who are living on footpaths and streets and slums, right? And uh, when there is a crisis situation, a lot of dog bite situation, a lot of dog bite incidents happen in India. I think one of the highest rab rabies cases comes from India. So that becomes a huge problem, not just from only point of view of animal, but also human beings. And second is, of course, dogs become carriers of a lot of diseases. They themselves get diseased and they become carriers of a lot of diseases. So not just from an animal point of view, but from a human animal coexistence point of view, it's important to include them in the disaster management plan. 
Now, within this research, I will only be talking about dogs. I am not considering other species here because as we include more species of uh, number of species that are there in Indian cities, um, the thing becomes more complex, super nuanced, right? So let's just talk about dogs here and why I chose dogs was um, around 30 million dogs across the country. One lakh, uh, 100,000 uh, 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 dogs only on the streets of Mumbai itself. And we don't even know if these are really exact numbers, right? Okay. And the second thing is, it's very interesting how we see dogs. How we And dogs are some uh, uh, animals that were brought to cities by human beings. They were domesticated by us and brought to cities by human beings. But at the same time today, in the uh, larger paradigm of the way urban development ideologies exist, they are seen as dirt or pests in cities. Um, there is always a distinction in India uh, from the pets inside the houses and the uh, urban animals outside. So we have huskies, labradors, retrievers and all sorts of uh, breeds that are pets with people. But uh, these animals uh, native to the country are definitely seen otherwise. <clears throat> and third is the dogs being associated with the poor or the disorderly classes. So um, talking about my methodology about this research, I did this um, right before the onset of pandemic actually in uh, March 2020. Um, so uh, my major uh, methodological uh, interventions was participant observation. So I uh, sort of uh, accompanied my key uh, respondents to feeding dogs every day and I'll talk more about it. I did uh, certain semi-structured interviews with relevant stakeholders, a lot of uh, secondary research, res uh, resource research. And my study site in Mumbai was Rajan Parachol that you see a picture of uh, in this uh, uh, slide. It's a very old settlement, 35 year old settlement. Um, <clears throat> and very uh, prone to uh, chronic flooding. It, you can see it's a low lying area. You can see the slope on the surface itself. Chronically, this area has been uh, getting flooded every year. Um, some of the research I started reading around, uh, uh, reading about animals and disasters. And what I saw was um, animals and disaster management research pertaining to it in India and in fact, many developing nations is lacking. And uh, uh, it mainly comes from uh, developed nations like US, Australia, New Zealand. I in fact refer to Steve's work a lot here. Um, and there also pets, livestock, lab laboratory animals, wild animals, uh, have been researched about. Um, urban animals, these stray, so-called stray animals are really lost in the picture somewhere. Um, so based on my research, um, few findings and few uh, uh, understandings that I have got that I will be talking about in the next few slides. Uh, so first thing is institutional thinking becoming a roadblock in India. So I think uh, most of us who have been working on animals and in disasters, uh, would read about, uh, read uh, Professor Leslie Irving's work. And I refer to her as well. And institutional thinking is something uh, uh, that really struck the chord because that is exactly what Disaster Management Plan of India is doing, um, including certain animals over the others. And that's where stray animals or urban animals, again, uh, are lost in the picture. So that is a huge roadblock in terms of policy making in terms of people working um, um, at certain level in bureaucracy uh, for the disasters uh, of uh, disaster management of animals. Second is if, if uh, the policy makers are not talking about this enough, then who is doing what at grassroots level? And this is where community led actions come in. <clears throat> As you can see, uh, I started talking to a lot of people who um, sort of feed animals regularly. And this has specifically seen a rise in India after the pandemic, after the lockdowns happened. A lot of people started feeding animals. So um, in a way, these urban animals, which we largely think our perception is that they don't add any value. They add a lot of value. They are equally agents of change they are shaping identity and politics in the country. So three uh, major uh, categories of people that I could understand in the civil society itself was first people who feed animals regularly. This boy that you see in these pictures is a 20 year old boy, an architecture student. Um, he uh, uh, feeds 200 animals every day. 
every day and he doesn't come from a very well off background he crowdsources money he is very active on instagram social media and uh, this is the kind of effort uh, he takes and many such other people then there are certain people who feed as well as rescue animals they have connections with local ngos as well and third is the animal welfare organization themselves especially the religious non governmental organizations um <clears throat> but the problem is that most of the ngos uh, their work is restricted till uh, uh, sort of um uh, providing medical assistance to animals and neutering animals because india has an abc program abc is animal birth control program um this is one of uh, the anecdotes by a person i talked to who uh, uh, is again very uh, active in uh, uh, talking about animal rights um and i quote i have been provided the authority of an animal welfare officer by the high court of india but i do not have any power a lot many people like me who fight for animals do not have protection and we are attacked several times this is very important and i don't know how come not more people in india are talking about this but uh, the conflict on streets is on a rise between people who do want animals on street and who don't want animals on street and these animal feeders rescuers people from ngos are subjected to um, a lot of violence every day every day so that becomes a second thing third very interesting thing that i saw is the marginalized communities coexisting with animals in crisis and otherwise also so this uh, picture that you see is a footpath dwelling these people are living on this footpath from a very very long time in mumbai in the same area um, <clears throat> and what i saw here the coexisting that i saw here was amazing because i saw that these people had small boxes made for animals they sleep with them they eat with them everything is happening together they know all of them know which dog is who which dog was picked up by which person which dog got displaced everything and whenever a flood like situation occurs these animals and these human beings are together in that crisis so um, but the, and also the second thing is that i mentioned in previous slide also that uh, in case um, uh, some dogs become aggressive or rabid or whatever these people are again at most risk uh, in that case um i would like to show a video to you all here because i have been talking about um the people just a second i have been talking about the people and the civil society uh, sort of um working for animal rescue and this is a video a very recent video in fact a week back this video this is uh, delhi where i am connecting to you all uh, from right now was inundated um, uh, because it's monsoon here it was inundated like mumbai and this is one person he's an athlete and he works very actively for uh, feeding dogs and rescuing dogs and this is one animal shelter which got flooded badly in the national capital region and how these guys are rescuing uh, dogs that we can see the water is rising every 5 to 10 minutes and it has started drizzling also some of the dogs over there are at the top of the tin and they're crying while we are uh, carrying them like this one by one trying to take them out i hope you all uh, the video was uh, the audio uh, was working um and yeah basically this is this is the situation uh, this all of this mobilization uh, is being done at the community level itself uh, which is uh, amazing but it is also equally putting these people at risk also uh, to bring this to your uh, attention is that this is a fairly uh, uh, privileged man uh, english speaking man with uh, the required resources that he can do this but there are many stories that go unheard of like i heard about this woman who's a rat picker in mumbai during my research only i heard about her she uh, collects waste and uh, she finds uh, uh, material that is fit for eating and uh, feeds the uh, uh, urban dogs so these are amazing stories and uh, they definitely need some legislation uh, for protection and for for having a certain sort of uh, <clears throat> power when they are working with uh, animals okay 
next is when i talked to all these people i sort of observed uh, what is happening around i thought of mapping uh, the uh, vulnerability of community uh, dogs um and interestingly this this has never been done and in fact if you see this uh, uh, framework you might think okay these are quite general points but these aren't <laughs> every point has a story right so um i uh, referred to uh, feminist scholars work who uh, basically say that uh, sentience ascription is of course important and it's a moral consideration when we say we should save uh, animals but um having a legal and sociological lens when thinking about uh, uh, vulnerabilities of animals becomes very important and that is how inherent and situational vulnerabilities come into being here uh, so in within the inherent vulnerabilities uh, <clears throat> the age of the dogs their health condition prior to disaster occurrence and trust me there are so many dogs with so many uh, 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 health conditions here already with skin infections with tumors and all of that is there um they become more prior, uh, prone to the uh, uh, flooding situation and the behavioral of uh, community dogs so many dogs uh, who have sort of some sort of trauma um uh, because of human beings or anything they become very distant to human beings they will always maintain a distance with you they will not come close to you so rescuing such animals even by community members then becomes very difficult uh this very interesting uh, uh, thing that was told to me by one of uh, uh people working in the ngo sector um she said that uh, nobody can fathom how many dogs drown when area gets flooded even by 1 to 2 feet of water and the puppies and mothers are the most vulnerable and helpless in fact she also said that cats are still at somewhat an advantage because they can climb dogs can not do that even so they become more vulnerable and then talking about situational vulnerabilities there are plethora of them so this is the beha behavior of the neighborhood community and civil society so like i talked about the shared vulnerability of dog feeders uh, uh, the caregivers to dogs and the community dogs themselves there are ngos which again are mostly focusing on neutering and uh, um, sort some sort of medical assistance but they are not on ground there's no research work happening um the attitude of local community during floods there are two extremes to this there have been many cases in india and in fact outside india also i was reading during my uh, literature review that people often refuse to get evacuated refuse to leave their houses till the time the dog or their pet is also taken along with them and that has been the same case with a lot of people in india they would not want to leave their uh, urban animals living in their streets because they all first share an affective relationship with them and then the adopting patterns of dogs is very interesting uh, a lot of people even if they want to adopt an urban animal they would go for male dogs and not female dogs because uh, it's easier to keep a male dog so female dogs in that case become very vulnerable <clears throat> second is infrastructural vulnerability water uh, availability is of course becomes zero food availability becomes zero there are open manholes and electric poles a lot of dogs and people even get electrocuted people have fallen into manholes in india and these are people i'm talking about we don't even know how many animals have fallen into uh, 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 manholes uh, then there is welfare work by ngos again it's about the neutering uh, the, the, the direction is only at neutering and of course the planning and construction activities mumbai is um, um it's on a rise for constructing bridges and flyovers and highways and and that is somehow um, um not at all uh, going to help the situation that we are in the flooding situation and saving animals and people in this situation um <clears throat> third uh, last is spatial vulnerability dogs who are already living in low lying areas in mumbai are anyway uh, very very uh, vulnerable uh so um knowing that dogs are vulnerable in a number of ways um and looking at the way the city administration uh, the city governance looks at them is very scary because the vision is to have an animal free city uh, so bombay high court mumbai high court uh, uh, in themselves said that mumbai has to transform into a stray animal free city and here we are talking about including them in disaster management plans so it's a challenge it's a fight um <clears throat> another person working in an ngo told me that this got con uh, country got its freedom seven decades ago but the animals never got free 
they still face cruelty abuse and inequality to what an extent can an animal lover go to protect them this is the sort of sentiment it's helplessness it's powerlessness it's there's no acceptance and honestly that it they, they are invisible in a way in the society so um coming towards the end of my uh, uh, presentation um some way forward uh, that i have understood through my findings of the research first is that it should and it must uh, open a discussion for multi species understanding of citizen relation to disaster and this has to be a, a, a human animal interaction approach and not just saving animal approach right um second is um, an inclusive approach to disaster management by policy makers is very important um <clears throat> third is uh, there is a need to broaden the scope of welfare of animals which is of course limited to neutering and feeding of uh, uh, feeding food to urban animals um the thing is that uh, uh, the disaster management plan when it was formulated a lot of consultant different stakeholders sit together discuss and uh, uh, then the document comes into form um in this case ngos can play a huge huge role the need is uh, for uh, uh, research and evidence based research right now and advocacy is very important and since community is so deeply engaged with animals on grassroots uh ngos can sort of uh, be the middle uh, uh, persons here to take whatever insights they have a plethora of knowledge that they have to uh, uh, the at the bureaucracy level at the policy making level and at the politics level and lastly a uh, a uh, <clears throat> beyond human environmental justice lens is very important this is environmental justice too not just right to the city uh, understanding um at the end of my presentation i'd like to uh, say that we often say that uh, the progress of a society is often determined by the way they uh, see their women right um we have to extend this argument now a progressive and compassionate society is and should be determined how it see its animals also and uh, that was my presentation thank you so much for being patient listeners and uh, we can sort of invite questions now Thank you so much to Rusha. If you stop sharing your screen, we did have one question that came up. Attacked by dogs or by other humans. Um uh can can you like explain the question a bit more? It 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 uh, did come up. It was right around I believe it was right after you played the video. I don't know if that helps you place it in your presentation. Mhm. Mm Attacked by dogs or by other humans. So please uh, our attendee if you could elaborate. Actually, I I must be I must be saying about the fact that there is a lot of conflict between people who are rescuing animals feeding animals and those who don't want animals around right? And in that case a lot of conflict human human conflict is happening right? a lot of dog uh, caregivers animal caregivers for that matter um, are subjected to violence every day i think uh, uh, i can uh, share n number of videos that get viral every day on social media because that's the only place where these people can garner some support so um, i think I, so, i was talking about that it was uh, the attendee clarified that it was the people who are official animal control are they being attacked by the dogs themselves or by other people i i am sorry your voice is breaking i apologize the question was the people who are official animal control yeah are they being attacked by the animals by the dogs oh no 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 or no, by no. other people by by other people by other people uh, not by dogs uh, by other people so this person uh, who was given the uh, uh, authority of being an animal welfare officer by the uh, high court um, himself said that i am attacked almost every day for doing my job and what i love to do and what i resonate with uh, so he was basically expressing the fact that even if i have been given some sort of authority on in in actually in on ground i have no authority and in fact honestly i didn't know that uh, the high court sort of gives such authorities to people that they can be animal welfare officers this is this is all um um 
it's not well known people don't know and this is all very new that people are coming out on streets uh, or helping animals so yeah wonderful we do have another question yeah do you get you can read it the question yeah, yeah. I I, I'll, I'll read the question. I'll answer it also. Do you get a feel that the future is brighter as people realize the importance of city animals and their relationships? Or is the grimness uh, dominant? Um, honestly, I want to keep an optimistic approach. Uh, thank you for the question. I want to keep an optimistic approach here um, because I think never before has it happened that people have been so active. The civil society has been so active in talking about animals, in advocating for animal rights. It is all uh, uh, organized at community level. In fact, I'll tell you, um, these feeders that I was talking about, they have organized themselves so well. They have WhatsApp groups. They decide, okay, what to feed the animal today and what will be the menu for tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, in case somebody is attacked or anything, these guys are there to support each other. So that sort of community mobilization is a very, very positive uh, uh, impact uh, that I see. But I also feel... Um, for it to be, uh, uh, for it to sort of become a movement, a lot of evidence-based research is required. We have to uh, uh, and give a scientific backing to everything, give a sociological and legal backing to everything. And that is why I said that the NGOs here, I feel, have the biggest role to play. Because they can be the one who can take what the community knows, what the community feels is right to um, uh, the uh, uh, government and policy makers. Um, I'll tell you one very interesting, if I have time, I can narrate a very interesting uh, uh, incident that happened recently with me. So this is not Mumbai, this is uh, Delhi itself. I was, it's a week back story. Uh, I was, uh, I met a municipal corporation official. He was the local councillor. And Delhi was, as I told, was inundated a few uh, days back. And I just asked him, so what happens to, uh, you know, the animals, the stray dogs and all? What do you do about them? So he said that, listen, the municipal corporation is only supposed to maintain uh, the infrastructure of the cities. We are not in charge of animals. We are uh, uh, highly bothered by the way animal lovers are uh, behaving uh, in the uh, areas that are flooded. They don't want us to displace the dogs, but the dog should not be there. So the stand that the animal uh, uh, caregiver community is taking is very ecological. They are territorial animals. They should not be displaced. In fact, according to the Constitution of India, it's uh, not um, allowed to displace dogs. But for MCD, for the municipal corporation, that seems the only uh, uh, solution because diseases, because conflict, because uh, dogs get aggressive and all. So there's a lot of conflict out there and nobody is sort of there to mediate the conflict or talk about it or give some scientific backing to it. So yeah, I think um, research and a lot of advocacy is very important uh, for the future to seem brighter in terms of accepting urban animalism cities. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us this morning, Tarusha.